Hey everybody, I hope you guys are all doing well. Um, this video is going to serve as an introduction for our next lab study, which is going to be something called NMR spectroscopy, or uh, which stands for Nuclear Magnetic Resonance Spectroscopy. All right. Oops, come on. All right. And so what this is, this is going to be sort of similar to IR spectroscopy in the fact that this is a type of absorption spectroscopy. Basically, what we're going to be doing here is we're going to be taking, you know, just like we saw in IR, we're going to be taking a source of radiation. Um, with IR, it was infrared. In the case of NMR, it's going to be radio waves, which are the longest wavelength of waves on the electromagnetic spectrum. And what you're going to do is, just like we saw with IR, you're going to send out a bunch of radio wa waves and a scan of different frequencies. You're going to send them at a sample. And you're going to have a detector. And the sample will either absorb the wavelengths of radio waves or they will transmit. And so, just like we saw with NMR spec, or excuse me, with IR spectroscopy, the detector will only detect the waves that are transmitted through. So, whenever you have absorbance, that will create a disturbance on the baseline and cause squiggles on a page. All right. Um, so. In that respect, IR and NMR, they're really, really similar, but they're also really, really different in a lot of respects. All right. First of all, um, the purpose of using NMR is a little bit different. IR spectroscopy is used primarily to identify different functional groups, right? Different families of reactive groups that might be present within a molecule, like, you know, do you have an alcohol group? Do you have an aromatic group? Do you have an alkene group? That kind of thing. NMR spectroscopy is much more in depth. It's actually used to elucidate the finer structural features. You can actually use NMR to detect the exact structure of a species, especially if you're using something like IR as a supplement to it. All right. Um, so, you know, it's considered probably the most useful type of spectroscopy in organic chemistry. It is also definitely more complex. So I'm going to be breaking these videos up into smaller chunks. Hopefully you guys can um, easier, more easily digest it. I can't emphasize enough. Go ahead and start reading the NMR chapter in your regular lecture textbook. Janice Gorzinski Smith, Organic Chemistry. I think it's chapter 14, but I'm not sure. Look it up. But go ahead and read through it. Even if you don't understand everything right off, it'll make things a lot easier to understand in the videos if you're already familiar with some of the terms. <clears throat> All right, so let's talk a little bit about, you know, it's just some of the background and theory about how NMR works. All right, first of all, there's different types of NMR spectroscopy. Basically, you can do NMR spectroscopy with a variety of different elements in different isotopic form. They have to qual they have to have a certain type of quantum spin within their nucleus. And I'm not going to get into that because I don't really think it's relevant here. But suffice it to say there are lots of different types, you know. There are NMR uh, spectroscopies based on hydrogen 1, carbon 13, nitrogen 15, um, oxygen 17, fluorine 19, etc., etc. I could keep going on. All right. And basically, each one of these is designed to sort of help you learn more about the different types of that respective element within a molecule. So, hydrogen NMR tells you about the different types of hydrogens that's present in the molecule. Carbon 13 tells you about the different types of carbons. Nitrogen 15, the different types of nitrogens, etc. By far, in a way, these two. Hydrogen-1 and carbon-13 are the most commonly used and probably the most useful forms of NMR. And we're going to be putting most of our focus on proton NMR. Um, 
because, again, it's probably still the most commonly one used, even more than carbon-13. And also, it's much more complex than carbon-13. Uh, we will go over and over carbon-13 NMR towards the end of the NMR lesson, but you'll find it's much, much simpler to work with uh, than H NMR. Also, it doesn't tell you as much information, though, so that's kind of the downside. All right. So, for the foreseeable future, we're going to be focusing on pro what we call H1 or proton NMR. So, I'm just going to stick a little H in front of there, and we're going to focus on that. All right. Let me erase. All right, and let me give you a little bit of background of, you know, how we actually get squiggles on a page. All right. If you're thinking about HNMR spectroscopy, you know, we're dealing with hydrogen nuclei. All right, so we're going to represent a hydrogen nucleus just with a little circle. All right, this hydrogen nucleus, when it's in its proper spin state, um, it's going to be constantly spinning around a vertical axis. All right, much like if you had like a uh, wooden bead with like a little stick through it or something like that, and it could spin around a little stick. All right, and whenever you have this spin around the uh, vertical axis, it creates a magnetic field. All right, and you know, depending on which way this nucleus happens to be oriented at any given time, that magnetic field could be facing any number of directions. Remember, the hydrogens are constantly bouncing around and moving around and stuff with the molecules, so they may be you know, going in lots of different directions. Right? All right, so basically what you do is you take a sample that has all these nuclei, and you apply a big old external magnet. And we're going to have, this is commonly represented by a B sub O. All right. So basically you have your sample and then you have a magnet. Um, that you bring into contact or n n proximity with these nuclei. And this is going to cause the orientations of the nuclei to suddenly change quite a bit. Okay, so I'm going to represent the external magnetic field with an arrow here. All right. And the external magnetic field in this case is you know, represented as pointing up. All right. So let's say we had um, six different um, nuclei here in this example. All right. Whenever you apply the external magnet, they're going to align in one of two ways. You saw they were going all over the place previously. Now they're going to go in two ways. They're either going to go with the external magnet or we're going to go diametrically opposed to it. Okay, that's it, just two states. And you see there's more of them that are aligned with the magnetic field. That makes sense, because it's a lower energy state to be aligned with the magnetic field instead of against it. All right? So that's sort of our, you know, baseline. All right, what you can do then is you can irradiate... I don't know why I'm adding sound effects, but there we go. You can irradiate these nuclei with a frequency of radio waves. All right? And if you happen to hit upon a frequency of radio waves that is, that is absorbed by a nucleus, this can happen. one of these ground state nuclei jumps up here to the higher elevated state, and now you have three and three. This has a name. This is called a spin flip. All right? So anytime you have a frequency of radiation, of radio wave, that matches the frequency of one of your ground state nuclei, it causes it to spin flip. It causes it to flip orientation and orient opposite to the external magnet. All right? 
Now, this is not a very um, stable state, right? That nucleus prefers to be on the ground. So what happens is, very quickly after you spin flip, this nucleus is going to fall right back down. And you're going to go back to the baseline. Okay. Now when that happens though, it's also going to release some energy. Okay. It received energy in the form of a radio wave. When it flips back down to its normal ground state, it gives off that energy. And this energy is actually what is recorded by the detector and helps to give you a squiggle on a page. And what's kind of interesting is, we said, you know, you have to have the right frequency of radio wave to cause a spin flip. Not all nuclei are going to spin flip at the same frequency. There are factors that make it sometimes easier to spin flip, right? Where you need, you know, you don't need a very high energy wave. And there's other factors that cause uh, nuclei to be really, really rigid and makes them really difficult to spin flip. And in those cases, you need higher energies. That is something that we can see on the spectrum, and that's how we can determine um, different types of environments that might be present around a particular H. All right. That is kind of the nuts and bolts of this. Um, you know, and like I said, all this is determined, all this is dependent on an external magnet right over here. Okay, and so the more you know, the more powerful your magnet is, generally speaking, the better the spectra that you get. And you can get, you know, magnets of all different types of powers, um, and they're traditionally me measured in megahertz. We have an NMR, uh, and we have a 45 megahertz NMR, and that is comparably weak um, compared to the stronger ones. Although it does a very, very good job in teaching and basic research, I've noticed. Um, but then you get higher. You know, a lot of the research universities will have 300, 400, 500, etc. Higher up uh, NMR. Um, and if you ever use them, it's a pretty cool process and kind of scary at the same time. They're usually in these giant uh, machines that take up an entire room. They are cooled by big tanks of liquid helium and liquid nitrogen. Uh, the magnets are so strong that you cannot go into the room with, a, with anything metallic. You don't want to go in with you know, any credit cards or anything that can be demagnetized. It, it's something else. The one we have is much different. It's a uh, it's a magnet. Does it's a very small magnet. Does not have to be externally cooled. Doesn't take up a lot of space. Um, in fact, our NMR is the size of a shoebox, which is really nice and convenient. But hopefully, you know, maybe if you're in a particular graduate program, you'll have opportunities to use different types of NMR along the way. All right. Um, let me show you what a typical spectrum might look like. I'm going to show you like a drawn one, and then I'm going to show you a, an actual one here in just a second. Basically, it's just an XY plot, just like we saw with IR. Okay, Just like with IR, the Y axis is going to be intensity. The X axis is going to be something called chemical shift. And it's measured in parts per million. If you're interested in the uh, calculations for that in the background, I'm not going to go over it again. I don't think it's that relevant, but it is in your book if you want to look at it. And the symbol for chemical shift is oftentimes a lowercase delta sign, just like that. Same thing that we use for partial positives and partial negatives. All right, and the chemical shift scale typically goes from... It can vary a little bit depending on what you program the software, but usually about 12 to 0. All right, And on uh, an NMR spectrum, you'll see a series of peaks. So you might see something like that. 
might see something like that. Something like that, right? Very, very uh, representative. All right, so this is going to lead into um, basically four different features of NMR spectra that you want to interpret in order to get an overall picture of what's going on. All right, before I list those, let me highlight a couple of things. There's a couple of terms that you need to be aware of. A lot of times, whenever we're describing signals, relative position of signals to each other, we'll use the terms downfield and upfield. And basically what this describes is the relative positions on the chemical shift axis. Upfield, the upfield direction is going left to right. Downfield is going right to left. Right, so in this case, we would say if we're looking at these two peaks over here, these two signals, we would say that the single peak is downfield of the triplet peak or the three peaked uh, signal. Okay. Um, let's see. Also, I want to highlight the fact that we have a zero point here. The reason we can have a zero point here is because we actually use a reference standard. The machine, if you don't put a reference standard, is the, and the machine doesn't really know what zero is supposed to look like. So, we always include a reference material. And that is something called TMS. TMS is short for tetramethylsilane, and basically what it is, it's a silicon that has four methyl groups attached. All right. Depending on your NMR and the software that you have, sometimes you'll actually see a signal at zero. You'll actually see like a, you know, a single peak coming up, or sometimes it'll be blank. All right, it just depends. But if you ever see a signal at zero, it doesn't mean anything as far as your particular sample. It's just always referring to the reference peak. We tell the machine that, hey, these H's right here should be our zero reference, and it compares every other H in the system to those. All right. All right, so... I'm going to try to keep this up here while I write the, write the rest of it. All right. Like I said, there's four features, four features that we can look at to determine the nature of a particular structure through NMR spectroscopy. Number one is the number of signals. If you look in this one that I just happened to draw, we have one, two, three, four different signals, right? Each cluster of peaks counts as an individual signal, right? So this particular one has four. And the rate number of signals refers to the number of non-equivalent H's. Okay, so basically what this means is that this particular one that I drew would have four signals. It means it has four different types of H's. And we've kind of seen this before in various contexts, right? We've seen that, you know, within a particular symmetrical molecule, for instance, you know, you might have two carbons that are basically identical. You might have hydrogens that are basically identical, right? For example, If you look in this example, we have H's at this carbon, at this carbon, at this carbon, and at this carbon, right? However, they're not all unique. The ones on the very end, they're identical to each other. The ones in the middle are identical to each other because of this line of symmetry, okay? So this one, this particular structure would only have two non-equivalent sets of H's, and it would only give you two signals. All right. 
So that's what I mean by that. We will go, by the way, we are going to go much more in depth to each one of these four points, so I will be coming back to that. All right, number two, we can look at chemical shift. Basically, where on the chemical shift axis does your signal appear? All right. If you remember back when we talked uh, about IR spectroscopy, we had wave number, the wave number axis, and we said that certain types of functional groups absorbed at certain wave numbers. That's basically the situation here. Protons that are in a certain type of environment can absorb at different points on a chemical shift scale. For example, the H's that are in an aromatic ring will absorb in a particular region. The H's that are attached to an oxygen will absorb in a specific region. Okay, And so if you look in your books, if you look online, you can look basically anywhere. You can find correlation tables for chemical shift in NMR, just like you did for wave numbers in IR. Okay, And so we'll be talking about the various type of aspects that can you know, in a, in a proton's environment that can affect its chemical shift. All right, the third thing that we're going to look at is what we call integrations. And integrations tell you information about the ratio of H's causing each individual signal. Right, so let's say you have two signals. Maybe you have one signal that's being caused by a group of two protons, another signal that's caused by a group of three protons, right? Looking at the integrations correctly will be able to tell you this information um, and help you to figure that out. All right, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to switch over to show you an actual NMR spectrum better illustrate this. I can't point with this, so you'll just have to follow my voice. All right. um, this one has a couple of things that my drawn, hand-drawn sample one did not have. First of all, you'll see these green squiggly lines that are above the respective peaks. They, they're sort of S-curves. They look a lot like the antiderivative symbols that you may have used in calculus. And this is appropriate because um, basically these are generated when the computer integrates the area underneath the curves in each signal. All right? And you can see these green squiggly lines have different sizes. You, know, you have the two on the left that are you know, small and about the same size. Then you have the two in the middle that are identical to each other, basically, but about twice the size of the first set, etc. Right? The ratio of these squiggly lines to each other can directly give you information about the ratio of hydrogens causing the signal. And depending on the type of software, the type of NMR you have, it might just give you the squiggly lines, or it might give you helpful numerical information as well. In this, And they, they express it in different ways. Uh, this particular one, if you look below the peaks, you'll see little brackets, little green brackets, and you'll see numbers. Like, for example, to the far left, you see for the first individual peak, you see a bracket of 1 a bracket, and then under it, it says 1. Then next to it, you see another bracket, and it says 1.08, right? Then you see, going further to the, to the right, you see uh, a two-peak signal with a set of brackets that says 2.2, .2. another set of brackets that says 2.19. What you can do is you can use these numbers and or the green squiggly lines to compare to each other to figure out the number of H's causing each one of those signals. All right. And then the fourth one is called spin spin splitting. And I hope I have enough room to write this. This tells you information about neighboring, come on. Neighboring H's other non-equivalent H's that might be in the area surrounding a particular cluster. All right. 
you'll notice that these peaks, or these signals, don't have uniform uh, numbers of peaks uh, within them. In this one, for example, on the far left, you have a single peak. The next one to the right, going uh, left to right, has three peaks. The third one has a big cluster of peaks. It's kind of hard to count. The fourth one has three peaks. Right? You can also see this in our real spectrum. Right? We have, uh, starting from left to right, we have a peak that has two sig uh, excuse me, one signal that has one peak, another signal that has one peak, another signal that has two peaks, another signal that has two peaks. Um, you have a small individual peak over here. I'm not sure if that's a real one or not. And then over here on the far right, you have a single peak. Um, basically, every NMR signal starts off as a single peak. We call that a singlet. But depending on what type of neighbors it has, we might have that single peak, that signal, single signal getting split up into multiple peaks. Right? And the patterns that we see, whether it gets split up into two peaks, three peaks, four peaks, whatever, that can tell us information about how many neighboring H's of a certain type that we might have. All right? So that's where we're going to go with this. Um, that's sort of the introduction, and then as we go forward, we're going to be going more in-depth about each one of these four aspects. So, um, until then, go ahead, review this video, make some notes, read the book, and I will have upcoming videos to talk about the four features. Until then, have a good day.